All right, this is now phase one of the youth soccer playbook for girls, specifically for girls. And now I'm really gonna to touch up on some of the changes, and it's not many, it's a few, that you would see differently, in my opinion, or what I would do differently with my daughter going through the US soccer system, okay? So let me start with the, the main objectives that we're gonna hit. There's actually kind of two parts to this, but the first part I'm gonna talk about now, and the first one is core skills. We wanna develop core skills with both feet. This is, again, primarily, primarily, probably 99.9% .9 dribbling. This would be left foot, right foot, skill moves, footwork, running with the ball, anything related to the player manipulating, using, and mastering the ball. So the player being my daughter, okay? Next one would be a beast in 1v1. Literally, when I mean beast, I mean dominating, destroying, beating every single player 99 times out of 100, 1v1. Now, in order to do that, my daughter would have to play thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of 1v1 scenarios in phase one. And I should have said this earlier and I didn't, I apologize. Phase one is between the ages of four to 10 years old. So it's really four and a half, five to 10 years old, but it's four to 10. And it's literally developing core skill to be a complete and utter beast with the ball and to dominate, literally dominate one versus one. Okay, and this is a minimum standard, by the way. I expect more than this, but just for reference, for my daughter, a minimum of 1 million touches on the ball by 10. Truly, I anticipate or expect like 2, 3, 4 million, you know, realistically, based on how much she's going to be touching the ball from birth to 10 years old. But I got to give you a number, and I'd rather shoot with a slightly lower one. So that's why I went with a million. And then we would really enter the competitive marketplace at nine or 10 years old. And the only way I would do this is if she has a base level of skill. So I'm completely comfortable with her skill level. That doesn't mean she can't play games. I just wouldn't put her on an actual team competitively. And like, you know, she would not be with a group playing consistent competitive games because a problem that I see is too many players at that age, one, don't have enough skill. Two, they're playing games way above their level. So for example, for most competitive teams at U9 and U10, probably 99% again, they're playing seven versus seven. And I have a huge problem with 7v7, which I'm gonna to touch on shortly, but just to give you that context early, okay? However, she would play 10 to 20 events by the age of 10 as a guest player. So this would be like in 3v3s, 5v5s, or whatever else we're working on. There might be an occasional 7v7 if she's really, really good. Uh, I don't really believe in that but at least it's available if I need it. And it would just, again, I'm trying to focus on those small sided actions to have her dominate because like, which I will touch up on in a second, but in 7v7, kids are pigeonholed into a position. They're gonna play defender and they can't attack or they're gonna play attack and the coach tells them, don't go back on defense. Well, I need to avoid those situations and we need to teach her that she needs to attack, she needs to defend, she needs to transition to attack and she needs to transition to defend. And the only way she can do that is playing in age group formats like a 3v3, like a 5v5 that actually allow her to do so. Because remember, this is between four and 10 years old and we have a timeline that we need to hit. And if we're not reaching these objectives because there's a long-term play here, especially if she's coming to me and saying, dad, I wanna be a professional. You know, she's gonna have to start learning what it actually takes <laughs> to be a professional. Okay, and assuming with the core skill, we're then gonna to touch up on individual tactical concepts on a very, ba I mean, again, basic level. This would be like things like turning your hips, shielding the ball, opening up correctly. Maybe if she's really mature, scanning, right? You know, checking your environment, which is, I think, very important, obviously. But again, it's just a very basic understanding of playing. And I've already highlighted a little bit, but tons of 3v3, tons of 5v5, and I am a big believer in futsal. You may or may not know this, but I'll tell you now. I played on the U.S. national team for futsal. I played in a World Cup in 2019 in Misiones, Argentina, with the United States men's national team, and I know how valuable futsal is, especially to players in this age range, one, but two, especially for players that have a core level of skill, because again, futsal allows you to hit all those pieces I was talking about earlier that 77 and above doesn't. And again, attacking, defending, transition to attack, transition to defense. 
And with 3v3 and 5v5, you have to be involved with the entire game the entire time you're on the field or on the court. So like for me, you got to remember, I'm trying to develop and put a path in place for my daughter to become a pro. And to be honest with you, it's much easier for a girl or a woman player to be a pro currently than a man. The, the, the marketplace for a man is way more competitive. So if you follow a blueprint and a plan, you have a higher chance of success. And the thing is, you have to think outside the box because the U.S. soccer system is not designed for you to succeed. It's designed for you to fail. How do I know this? I've been in it. I've been through the entire system. Now, before I continue, I'd like to ask for your support. And if you find value in this playbook, in this specific video, then please share this to a friend that may need the advice. This is why I'm putting this content together completely free because I was once in your shoes and didn't have access to material like this to help my family make better decisions that were never athletes. So if you know somebody that could benefit from this content, whether it's the audio version, the video version, or the text version, please share it. Okay, now back to phase one. So like I said, let's do a quick overview and touch up on these things. And I know you're gonna ask, so I'm gonna answer it now. Would I worry about passing? No. Unless my daughter is an absolute rock star where everybody's coming up to me begging me for her to be on the team, I'm not going to focus on passing yet because I still don't believe she's good enough. One, that doesn't mean she won't pass a ball. I'm not saying she can't pass, but I wouldn't be focusing on it. Now, this is key, and I wanted to wait this long because I was hoping to see if you were paying attention to the video. And if you are, you're going to get this golden nugget because this is where it slightly changes in my perspective and in my opinion from what you would do with a boy and what you do with a girl. Now, the best players that I have ever trained from the women's perspective, the girls' perspective, that have gone on to play top-level Division I, they all have a few things in common, obviously, like work ethic and whatnot, but they all clearly highlighted this, and I did this with them as well, is they would play with boys. And my daughter, when she's ready to go into competitive, even before that, she's going to play with boys. Now, you got to understand, I'm not an expert on women development or anything like that, but I know and I've been told that women develop faster than boys, especially at this age range. Well, I've watched a lot of girls football and it's nowhere near as aggressive or competitive as the boys side. So one of the best players that I worked with in girls and women's football, she scored 40 goals her high school season, basically every single year. So you can do the math in four years, how many goals she actually scored, it's kind of ridiculous. But the point is, she always attributed to her success continuously playing with boys. And then what I found was when she played, she played like a boy. Now, I'm not saying she has to do that. But what I'm saying is playing with boys toughens them up and they deal with the reality of stronger, more competitive, typically players. And that's what we're looking for is to push her to have that aggressiveness and that edge that you don't typically see with the average girl player, especially in this country. So that's why primarily, I'm talking again like 98.7% of the time, my daughter's gonna play with boys. There may be some occasions that she plays with girls, but the primary focus would be with boys to help develop that aggressiveness and that ruthlessness. The other thing that's very important too is if she has the level, and even if she doesn't outside of like t training, we can have her play against older players. And I think this is important because it's great that you can play your age group, but playing your age group in the long run means nothing because at some point, to be honest, you're gonna have to phase out of that. So again, the more that she can overcome, my daughter can overcome adversity and push through those barriers by playing against older players, like older boys or older girls, and she can hang and handle that, or even if she can't, she's developing the mind to be able to do so, that's only gonna to add to her benefit later. And I think people misunderstand that concept because the players that make it at the highest level, even if it's going to college, like a top D1, or if you're lucky to be a professional, you gotta understand, skill is a prerequisite. If you don't have it, you'll never be looked at. So it's like, it's a base core skill, okay? What really separates like an amateur player that has skill compared to a collegiate or even a professional player is the mental side of the game. Can they handle that adversity? And we really need to be pushing this barrier at this phase, okay? Now, somebody asked me this on the boys' side, and I will highlight it for the girls' side. Would I be overcompensating, or not compensating, but like focusing on 
her performance? No, I wouldn't. The only thing that I would ask her to control would be mistakes. And I'm kidding with that. It wouldn't be a mistake. That was a joke. What I would actually push her on though for real and what I would say a consequence for a punishment would for would be a lack of effort. Right? Literally the mistakes was a joke. I was just kidding because everybody berates their kids for mistakes. It's a joke. I'm human. I make mistakes. You're human. You make mistakes. My daughter's human. It's natural for her to make mistakes. It's okay. It's a part of the learning process. So my point is if she wasn't giving 100% effort, I would absolutely rip into her. Be like, hey, where's the effort? Attacking, defending, transition to defense, transition to offense. And if she's doing that, then great. Because what I'm noticing is from the modern player, because we have this real big issue of instant gratification, kids are not pushing themselves anymore to the level that they used to on all sides of the ball. In fact, I had a player of mine that I do training with. He's uh, 2011. And he's like, well, Messi doesn't play defense. Why do I need to play defense? And I'm like, are you Messi? No, but he doesn't play defense. Why do I have to play defense? Uh, Bud, Messi has earned the right to, uh, to not play defense. When you become the greatest player of all time or one of them, and you've won like seven ball on doors and you've scored 700, 800 goals, you can kind of do what you want on the field and people will pay you to do so. So get there first and then you can talk about not playing defense. Otherwise, you better be busting your butt the entire time. And that's what I'm going to tell my daughter. That doesn't mean she has to run around the field like uh, a headless chicken, but you need to give effort the entire time in 100% effort, attacking, defending, transition to defense, transition to offense. And again, for me, players that make it to the highest level are the ones that are willing to sacrifice and put in that hard work. Okay, now I wanted to touch on this too, but before I do, again, if you have somebody you think would be benefiting from this, please share this with them. Whether it's uh, a boy player, a woman player, girl player, please share it. I'm trying to help educate people and give them a platform to be successful in this system. So there's one more piece really to phase one that I want to touch on that I haven't already shared, and this is juggling. And it's actually interesting. I've been getting a lot of hate for the juggling content that I've been posting, but juggling is a core skill, and I have not found a better way to develop what I call touch, your ability to control the ball without using juggling. Like people will say, hey, go play soccer tennis or go play volley." Well, if you can't control the ball well, how are you going to play those games? And the best way that I found to develop touch is through juggling. So by the end of her 10th birthday, I'm going to have these targets in front of her. And I'm going to say, your goal is to pass these. So probably introduced by six or seven. Hey, you know, you got a couple of years. You need to work on these because juggling's hard. Most kids don't like juggling. I got to be honest with you. But once they catch that fire she will explode with it. And that was the same thing for me. Like, I hated juggling. I couldn't stand it, by the way. Like, I, I just despised it. And then one day, it clicked in my mind, and I went from nine juggles to 63 at nine years old. And ever since then, I've absolutely loved juggling, right foot, left foot, different variations of it. And I did pretty good touch because I've developed it over time. So the targets would be for juggling 50 right, 50 left, 50 both, so those are the three main ones. There's more, right? And I need to make sure this is clear. You would be using, or she would be using her shoelaces, not her toes, like not the tippy toes, the shoelaces to make good solid contact because there's two types of juggling. One is freestyle where you use the toes and you can actually go to YouTube and search freestyle world championships and you'll see that. It's all tricks and flicks and it's freestyle, not football players. The other side would be what I call game-based juggling where you use primarily your shoelaces. So again, 50 right, 50 left and 50 both, and there's more. Next one would be three and up. So that means like you juggle three times. So one, two, three, play it up in the air. And she would have to control with the inside of the foot and the shoelaces. The next one would be what I call around the world. This is tough, but you would do foot, thigh, head, chest, thigh, and foot in order. So you would play the ball from your foot to your thigh, to your head, to your chest, to your thigh, to your foot in that order. And then next one would be up and over. So again, you'd probably juggle three times. So you juggle a couple, one, two, three. You play it up and over your head. So you have to turn around and go get it. That would be up and over. Next one would be three up to chest where you juggle three times. One, two, three, play it up in the air. Control up the chest. And then primarily the other one would be foot, thigh, and foot. So you play, for example, right foot, right thigh, right foot. And there's some other ones you can do, but those are just the ones that I wrote down for the for the for phase one. And there's more, but... 
remember, touched will be developed. And the key thing that you guys need to understand is training always starts at home. So training, education, and development, in my opinion, starts at home. And you need to put your player, which this is the same thing I will do, to understand that hard work will pay off and sacrifice will pay off and outworking people will pay off. You just have to be willing to stay consistent and push the barrier over a period of time. And she's going to have to actually, and this is important for me, she will earn it. We're not giving her anything. A lot of parents will give their kids everything and they say things like, I want to give my child what she didn't have. For me, <laughs> ain't going to happen because I came from that. I came from an environment where I had not everything, but almost everything I ever wanted as a kid. Uh-uh. My daughter is not going to have that luxury. She's going to have to earn every single thing that she does and that she gets. Because again, instant gratification for me is real. And I see a problem today with our youth where like, for example, they go get a water break and they're on their freaking iPhone 14 Pro Max. That ain't happening with my daughter. She gets a cell phone. It's a brick phone. So we'll see what happens. But I think you get the point. She's going to earn everything that she gets and she's going to understand that life is not fair. How bad do you want this? Because she might have a head start because I'm, I'm her coach or you know I'm around football so I know what I'm talking about. And I have experience with developing kids to get to good levels. And I've even trained professional players. But she's going to have to earn this, man. They're, I'm not giving her any handouts. If she wants to be successful in life and not average, like almost everybody else on the planet, you're going to earn this. So... I'll see you guys in uh, next video, which is phase two. Remember, phase one is from four to 10 years old. See you guys there.